Silicon Valley is growing, the economy is heating up, we have housing being produced, uh, land use and transportation plans taking place, and there is a growing need to provide high quality transportation options for a variety of reason, reasons, improving our quality of life, uh, increasing access to jobs for low-income communities, improving the environment and lowering our, our, our greenhouse gas reduction, our greenhouse gas emissions. So there's a, a variety of different reasons why we need to get moving, and so that's why we're here today. And, um, and so I'm going to go over a few, really quickly, few transportation and land use plans taking place. Some of you might be like, well, what is Chris talking about when he mentions transportation and land use plans? One thing that's going on right now is the Valley Transportation Plan 2040 for VTA. And that's going to decide, it's really a process to decide our future transportation investments and plans moving forward for the next 30 years. There's also a light rail efficiency project taking place with VTA. So some of you might uh, have had some complaints about light rail's relative inefficiency, maybe going slow in, some, in certain parts of the, of the valley. Well, uh, VTA right now is looking at putting in express trains in the north along the Mountain View corridor, and then also fixing that little segment right there that's, for many of us that use light rail, uh, uh, ongoing annoyance trying to get to Oak Ridge Mall, for example, where you got to transition, you gotta, you got to jump off the, the train just to go one stop or two stops to Almaden. So there's a variety of different changes taking place with the light rail system and that you should know about and opportunities to get involved with that. Another thing that's going on is bus rapid transit. So there are three bus rapid transit routes that VTA is currently planning that will provide much greater, a much greater level of service for the bus system uh, than ever before, really, for Santa Clara County. And so it's, uh, the first route is, is already in the later, latter stages of planning, and that will begin service within the next year and a half to two years. Uh, VTA, correct me if I'm wrong on that. And, and that's the Alum Rock line, going along one of the most well-utilized corridors in the valley along Alum Rock and Santa Clara Street. There's also another corridor planned on El Camino Real, which is currently going through the environmental review process, where you as a community will have an opportunity to voice your opinion uh, and also ask any questions about the project, about any potential impacts, and so forth. And then finally, there's a Stevens Creek Bus Rapid Transit Corridor, which will connect East San Jose, downtown San Jose, to De Anza College in Cupertino. And that is, those two routes, those two major corridors, the 22, 23, and 522, carry about 30% of ETA's entire bus ridership. So very important opportunity to improve our transit system there, especially for the people that really need it. Finally, we also have Caltrain modernization taking place. We're having a workshop on that as well. Uh, Santa Clara County is going through its general plan update, which uh, Susan uh, will, Stewart will talk about in a, in a few minutes. And also, we have the City of San Jose here today to talk uh, in one of their workshops about their urban village planning process. For those of you who don't know, the City of San Jose recently adopted their general plan, which is a guiding plan for development for the city. And they are looking at developing these urban villages in 70 different locations throughout the City of San Jose. Some of those locations have high quality transit already, some of them not so much. So, good question is, you know, you know, what kind of transportation alternatives can we provide to those areas where we are going to see growth? City of Sunnyvale is, is currently going through its Horizon 2035 process. So, just to say there's a huge amount of planning and transportation processes taking place where you can get involved. Chances are, if you live anywhere in Santa Clara County, there's something going on right now that affects you. And just to let you know, uh, Transform is going to be releasing a Google map that will highlight all the different transportation and land use planning processes taking place geographically in Santa Clara County with information about them, timelines, uh, key staff people to connect with, as well as uh, any upcoming meetings. So uh, if you're interested, make sure to, to plug in with Transform and, and find out what's going on in your community. Finally, there are also state opportunities to, to get involved at the state level. We're talking about county level things, but of course what happens at the state ref definitely affects us here in Santa Clara County. And we're having a lobby day. Uh, so there's another summit taking place. If you like this one, Transformers is organizing a summit in Sacramento in April. There's materials uh, out over there next to the Transform table. Feel free to, to grab the flyers and, and join us in Sacramento for uh, our, our summit and lobby day. So today we hope you will learn, engage in constructive dialogue, and 
basically learn how to create more healthier communities connected with better transportation options. And so why does transportation matter? So there's social equity implications, there's implications for the environment, our quality of life, and of course the economy and our health. Why should we care? Well, we have a few uh, speakers today that are going to uh, enlighten us on why does transportation matter, how can we get involved as effectively as community members, and so I'm going to present them today. They're going to be part of our plenary, and that is uh, Susan Stewart, if you can come up please, from the County Public Health Department. And, and actually, uh, if you could just raise your hand, Dwayne. Dwayne Marsh from the uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development, and Council Member Ash Kara from District 2, who is the board member, uh, the director of the Bay Area Qu Air Quality Management District, the chair of the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, as well as the vice chair of the Valley Transportation Authority. Well, every day, decisions about what we do, where we work, how we play, how we worship, how we even get into trouble, are framed by the transportation choices we make, if we even have a choice at all. And almost every household, transportation is one of the top two expenses, along with housing. Uh, and in fact, we find that transportation plays a major role in what your housing costs. And if you're curious about that, I'm sure amongst the sessions today, there are going to be some people talking about the relationship between transportation and housing. Uh, the money we invest in transportation, uh, both as a locality, as a region, as a state, as a nation, fundamentally affects every person who lives here. It's just a hugely important issue. Now, every so often a major step forward comes about in the field of practice and it changes the way we think about transportation and therefore the form of our communities, our nation. In the late 19th century, uh, the rail redefined the shape of the nation, the actual state boundaries and the, 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 the landscape of our nation. In the 1950s, uh, the, the, the interstate highway system really was a, uh, a driver for reshaping that landscape. And it, there were some serious economic winners and losers in the process. And we still deal with the implications of those choices that we made in the 50s about where um, highways went. There's nobody here who hasn't been affected uh, by those decisions of 70 years ago. In the 1990s and the 2000s, we found that uh, the need to think about alternative forms of transportation to deal with uh, environment and climate issues have started to reshape the conversation about what our choices are around transportation. And I'd say now there's probably as good a time as any for the next big idea. I think that we really have to figure out uh, how we're going to move forward as a community. Uh, you're, you could be the person, in fact, who comes up with that idea and really dealing with some of the, the big dilemmas we have around transportation right now, which include increasing costs, uh, decreasing revenues, a rapidly changing population with increasingly diverse needs for transportation, and the, tr the struggle to maintain our global standing as a, as a nation when our infrastructure is reaching its useful lifespan. So uh, ultimately the conversation about transportation turns to money. And maintaining a transportation infrastructure is a hugely expensive proposition. Outside of defense and the major entitlement programs, there's nothing else that our federal dollars are committed to more than transportation investments. And this has huge implications for our spending policies, for land use planning, for job creation, and economic development. Now you might ask, how huge? How about half a trillion dollars huge? That was what was expected to happen uh, in our last transportation authorization. So about every six years, Congress wrestles with uh, how to make choices about transportation investments. A lot of it is highway, but the other forms of transportation as well. And uh, in 2010, that was supposed to happen again. And there were all sorts of big ideas. This time it was going to be transformational. We were going to look at the change in our ways of our choices and our options and looking at gas prices and thinking about all these issues and come up with a truly landmark bill. Well, it was kind of difficult to get to that compromise. And in fact, uh, in the political gridlock we've seen in DC of late, they weren't able actually to do that for up to three years. And so just uh, this late last year, they realized they couldn't do the usual six-year bill. But they did pass a two-year bill for just $100 billion. And I think that was even a recognition of, despite the, the kind of intransigent uh, battles in, that we see in Congress right now, they knew the country couldn't survive without some kind of transportation policy in place, even if it was shorter than what was desired. Now, one thing that was interesting when this happened was uh, the Department of Transportation, which actually manages all these transportation dollars and passes them on to the states and localities, 
had to keep functioning. And so they had to experiment with new ways of doing business that didn't come from the authorization. And the genie's kind of out of the bottle now. There's some great innovation, experimentation on different kinds of programs, um, new ways of thinking about doing formulas for funding and discretionary programs where they actually could make some competitive choices. Communities tried new things. And so I think we're, we have a laboratory around the country now of new options around how to deal with that. Uh, transportation affects the economy in other ways. Uh, highway investments are enormous uh, job creation creators in the, during the construction phase. Uh, they have implications for local communities and how they plan in, uh, around those highways. Uh, the other kinds of infrastructure that we invest in also create jobs. Uh, rail and freight decides how competitive we are, uh, you know, both nationally and internationally. And then transportation essentially connects us to everything that we do, to our employment opportunities, to education, to our engagement in civic life. I mean, ideally, we could have had a nice even spread of hands when we asked how everybody got here and not all relied on cars or even being forced to drive alone because you couldn't even figure out how to connect with the person that you could have ridden over with. But transportation is about more than just getting around as well. Uh, there is, uh, you know, a shift happening, and it's, as I said, over the last 20 or, or 30 years, we've started to see more concern about not just being in the automobile, and we live in an area where that's really, is that my five-minute warning already? We live in an area that's uh, where there's more conversation about that than almost anywhere in the country, but despite that, we have to remember that for a lot of people, commuting to work is still about driving. And you'll see the numbers are, are moving down slowly over the years. Now it's about 76% uh, of people still rely on uh, automobile for get, getting to work. But that's down from numbers that were in the high 80s and, and low 90s before. Um, at this rate, we'll be down to 70% of uh, drivers being, uh, commuters being single occupancy drivers over the last 40 years or so. Those, that's the slide you see over the last 15 years. It's been a slow move, but a move nonetheless. But transportation is also about some other issues, and, and Chris mentioned uh, social equity, and uh, transportation is vital to local economic development. Uh, jobs and businesses rely on good transportation access in order to, to have viable businesses. Uh, they create access to housing and opportunity, and there's, uh, I'm sure, at least a couple of panels today that will dive into that connection between housing and uh, an, an opportunity that comes from where transportation is placed. Where highways um, uh, have been laid have had devastating effects for some communities and invigorating effects for others. In fact, uh, who in here knows somebody who has been impacted by the placement of uh, a highway? And think about this, most highway placements are more than 30 or 40 years uh, removed now, and yet still we see hands from people who, whose families or people they know have been affected by that. Who lives in a neighborhood where transit has come in and the housing prices have started to shift as a consequence? <laughs> exactly. And how many of you use uh, public transit at least once a week, let's just say? And how many use it for an essential errand? Okay, so you're starting to see both at the small scale of your everyday life and the large scale of how maybe your family history is affected, transportation ha has impacts for you, and it's an equity issue. Uh, also affects how we deal with issues around disaster planning, around how we get access to local foods, public health, energy efficiency. Uh, it's one third of the greenhouse gases essentially that we have to deal with as we look at climate change issues. So it's really important for us to deal with that. There are a lot of challenges to dealing with that though. Uh, it's a very difficult uh, issue, it's very complicated. Um, change is often threatening for the established way of doing business. Uh, planners who work on these issues are realizing now more and more they have to be better communicators to groups like yourselves to figure out how to have a dialogue on this. And uh, you know, there's a fiscal crisis right now at all levels of government. And so how do we pay for these things becomes really important. There are incredibly long time horizons for how we uh, deal with transportation issues. You heard a mention of a plan for 2040. I'm just trying to get through next week. I can't think about 2040. And I'm, my job is to do these things. I work in planning. So how you as a resident or an individual can think about 30, 40 year time spans is really difficult. And then because of the way our government is structured, there are all these different stove pipes or kind of silos in which these decisions are made and how we connect those are really important. And it's really comprehensive and complex and difficult to negotiate. Now, I actually went to school uh, a while ago to learn about planning a little bit more so I could be better at my job. And I'll admit the transportation classes were the most daunting. There was all this calculations and formula and engineering and stuff you had to be you know, good at. 
and the transportation planners, you know, they were just they had this kind of this kind of a look or this feel they had about. They just were there and they just had this. It was just really intimidating. But the work I've done since then, and you guys, I see the transportation plan and smile. You're like, that's right, we were the tough guys on campus. <laughs> but you, uh, you, you know, the work I've done since then has made me realize that it's equally important uh, to have a healthy dose of common sense and lived experience. And in fact, I would argue that we can't really do effective transportation planning unless we have all of these things. Uh, working in unison, and we've seen evidence over the last decades that's the case. And so, you are an important component in this formula that really makes for effective transportation. And we get the evidence. Uh, people do understand the importance of transportation, uh, at least intuitively, if not exactly the terms they need to use to discuss that. And one of the things I'd say is that uh, we know that people want options. Uh, people are tired of only, nobody wants to get rid of their car necessarily, although there are a lot of people who do. But uh, even if they have a car, they want to have the option to have some other kind of transportation. And polling, and this poll comes from some data that was connect, conducted for Transportation for America, uh, a group that works on these issues, shows that people want more options, that people would like to spend less time on their car, that they uh, don't like just having uh, no choice but to drive. You saw your hands go up. One in five people say they use transit in a given month. And then those who haven't, many say the barriers, it's not available. And most people think it would benefit their own community, but almost everyone thinks it would benefit the nation. More importantly, uh, people recognize that if we don't have good transportation infrastructure, we're not really going to be competitive around the world. And you see these two questions, uh, 62 and 55 percent respectively, people strongly agreeing that A, the best transportation systems are somewhere else and B, that our nation's transportation infrastructure is really not uh, reliable and it's outdated. Those aren't good things to have as barometers for where we're going going forward. Another thing we know is that people feel like public safety is uh, essential when we think about transportation issues. People want transportation to increase their public safety, not weaken it. And so you see across the board the, uh, that safe streets for our children and our communities is a number one priority. And then finally, which I think is especially important now, people recognize that transportation infrastructure decisions shouldn't be based solely on politics, that there is good science, there is good practice, there's good experience that should come into this, and nobody wants it to be a fully political decision. This is a pretty complicated slide, but just the blue says, don't let it all be about politics. So the other thing that I'd like to point out is uh, that smart transportation choices uh, really support the creation of sustainable communities. And what do I mean by sustainable communities? You may have heard this term before. In fact, who has heard of the term sustainable communities? Okay, we got ringers in the room here. People have been working on this stuff. So I, I will put a couple of definitions out there. Um, you know, this notion of not compromising the future generations to meet their needs as we meet our own needs, this intersection of social issues, environmental issues, and economic issues. Uh, for some, it's balancing you know, economic and natural needs. How do we have a high quality of life and attract residents and businesses, but still think about uh, future generations? These are all the, the, the essence of, we might all have slightly different definitions. In fact, if I guess the 180 of us in the room all wrote out on our definition, I doubt any two would be exactly the same, but those core elements would probably be there. So as a federal government, and I do work for the federal government, it may surprise you to know that we're working in some new creative ways to improve transportation outcomes. And I want to close by sharing a little bit about that. Um, HUD, my agency, uh, Department of Transportation and EPA, are in a partnership to think about how we can uh, sustain, prov promote sustainable communities. And you see we have six basic principles that drive our work. And we've been looking at our grant making programs and our planning, regulations, and all the things that we do as federal agencies to figure out how to be more effective at doing that. We've kind of split our roles in the partnership. For HUD's part, we think about long-range planning in communities. We invest a lot of money in neighborhoods and trying to think about how that money can be more effectively invested. The Department of Transportation thinks about all the capacity it builds around transportation investments and how it can do that more effectively and, and all the, the transportation money that it manages and how it can be more effective. And the Environmental Protection Agency is thinking about its own regulatory structure and its technical assistance it provides to communities to deal with environmental issues and how those relate to transportation. The office I work in, and if I catch uh, up with some of you later, I can talk more about this, really works on community plans. And so we've now invested about $240 million in uh, 143 grants around the country. Uh-oh, something's going off. I'm in trouble. Is there a way to stop that? Um, and so we've invested there. And uh, basically, we now have grants in almost every state. Uh, most of these are thinking about long-range planning in communities. I don't really know how to stop that little noise. Um, and by the way, I should mention that you guys are in a community that it has one of these grants. The Metropolitan Transportation Commission is, oh, that's me. 
<laughs> that was my own warning to stop. Um, it's a $5 million grant to work on these issues. And so we can talk more about that grant that's affecting your community with that long range planning horizon as well. Um, just a couple of things that I mentioned, these, these things present very high savings. A small investment can lead to billions of dollars saved. Um, in the examples you see in Chicago and Salt Lake City, we're finding that by thinking about the community planning and how transportation is invested over the long haul, we save much more money than we have to spend to do that. It's not just urban communities or rural places as well. And the, you know, I'm working personally with the tribe in South Dakota that's rethinking its economic development and bringing their cultural aspects of sustainability back into the current planning practice, again, with long range benefits. So my seventh and final point is that your actions can make a difference locally and across the nation. And again, I can't stress to you how impressed I am that you guys are all here today to talk about these issues. There are some areas that we talked about at the national level that are critical for reform as we think about transportation that I think are as equally important here locally. Uh, performance measurement and accountability. When you're spending trillions of dollars over decades, you need to prove that what you're doing works. And so how do we actually measure progress in meaningful ways? When you talk about the institutional structures that handle that money, you want to make sure that they know how to deliver and that they're accountable. And so that's an important frame as well. You have to think about the way programs are structured to have those impacts and think about what has worked and go further with that. And then what hasn't worked and change it and you have to think about revenue and finance and how to pay for things, and that's a big question right now. But the community engagement piece is really critical. You guys are using new tools. You could be uh, helping us create new tools. Your important voices, whether you're with business or the building community or if you're a low-income resident or a young person or in a community of color, uh, we need to have governance that's more diverse. Communities that are diverse need governance that's diverse, and that's something that's been a real focus. And there has to be real accountability that we ensure equitable outcomes from the huge investments we make. So with that, I'll stop for the moment. I'll mention that we have a resource site on our own website that we can make sure it gets shared with everyone. And I look forward to the conversation with my colleagues. When most people think of public health, uh, they probably think of the prevention of infectious disease, things like HIV and TB testing and flu shots and maybe restaurant inspections. And throughout most of the 20th century, that's what public health departments did. They focused on infectious disease. But during the 20th century, the major causes of death shifted from infectious to chronic disease. Things like heart disease, diabetes, cancer, respiratory disease. That are all, and these are all diseases influenced by social factors and the physical environments we live in, which in turn shape our behaviors. You know, whether or not how, how healthy the food is that we're eating and how much physical activity we get. This slide is, um, shows you the causes of death in Santa Clara County, and as you can see, the top two are cancer and heart disease. So the way we design our communities, the proximity of schools, work, and services to housing, the location and number of tobacco and alcohol outlets, the availability of parks and open space for recreation, and the availability and safety of walking and biking paths and public transit, all have effects on our physical and mental health. Healthy community design can increase physical activity, reduce injury, increase access to healthy food, improve air and water quality, decrease mental health stresses, strengthen community and reduce violence, and provide fair access to services, resources, and, and education. And it can minimize the effects of climate change. But we have a lot of work to do because during the period of time that chronic diseases became the major killers, our community environments also began to change. We designed our streets and roads to move large numbers of cars and trucks quickly, sprawling suburbs segregated housing away from services like grocery stores and were laid off, often laid out in cul-de-sacs, which were thought to be safer, but made it harder to get from point to point on foot or on bike. New schools were built on the edges of community where land was cheap, making it harder for kids, kids to get there on their own steam. And sometimes we built entire communities without connected sidewalks and we let our transportation systems decline in a lot of cases. And during this same period, overweight and obesity rates increased and physical activity declined. One third of children in Santa Clara County are overweight or obese, but as this slide shows, the burden of disease is felt more heavily in some communities than others. Gilroy has a rate 43.6%, San Jose 36%. And as this slide shows, large percentages of adults and youth in Santa Clara County still aren't getting the recommended amounts of physical activity. 
Of most concern are children and teenagers who need at least an hour of, of vigorous physical activity a day. And in Santa Clara County, over 40% said they didn't get daily physical activity in the previous week. Another major change is the way that children are getting to school. In 1969, about 42% um, uh, biked and walked and roller skated, as I did when I was a kid. And then by 2001, that had declined to 16%. And I just saw something on the Safe Routes to School National Partnership website that said it in 2009 it was down to 13%. So this means that most children don't have this type of physical activity as a regular part of their daily life. And I think this has been an enormous change. And one of the consequences of so many people driving uh, their kids to school is that it can make it less safe for children who are walking and biking and for others in the neighborhood. For instance, the elderly who are in neighborhoods during the daytime. According to a Department of Transportation study, 10 to 14 percent of all personal vehicle trips made from 7 to 9 in the morning were trips to take kids to school. And between 2007 and 2009, nearly 800 bike and pedestrian collisions occurred near schools in San Jose Unified School District. So a major area of focus for the County Public Health Department is to get kids back to walking and biking to school in safe environments. But shifting gears, so to speak, to talk about public transportation, there's a piece of good news. We know that transit riders are more physically active. They walk 19 minutes a day on average, and one-third meet the minimum daily requirement for physical activity during their commute. And transit ridership per capita in the Silicon Valley increased by nearly 5% in 2011, according to the index of Silicon Valley, which just came out. But as we know, we still have lots of people driving alone to get to work. Drive alone data for cities in Santa Clara County range from 67% for Palo Alto to 78% for San Jose to 84% for Campbell. Still another major, major change in the environment which has been thought to play a role in the obesity epidemic is the increase in the amount of food and beverages eaten away from home. This has a lot to do with our on-the-run lifestyles and the amount of time that we're on the road. When surveyed, two out of five Santa Clara County adults reported eating at a fast food restaurant at least once a week. A number of studies have found a relationship between the consumption of healthy and unhealthy food and the neighborhood environment. Um, these slides show how many more places there are to buy fast food, the slide on uh, is the right, uh, compared to fruits and vegetables in Santa Clara County. Affordabil affordability and availability of housing plays a very important role in the amount of time people spend commuting in a car. In the Silicon Valley, there are three jobs for every available housing unit, so this falls very hard on people of lower incomes. According to a report by Urban Habitat, one-third of those who are commuting into the county earn less than $40,000, and 18% earn less than $15,000. And this is expected to get worse as the economy rebounds. And long commutes are stressful and take time away from family and housing. Another major health concern is traffic-related injury and death. Nearly one-third of Americans don't drive at all, which speaks to how important it is to design streets that support walking, biking, and transit use. So think about it. A third of people don't, uh, don't drive. And, and, and yet, where are our priorities in terms of the way we're um, developing things? The concept of complete streets, which is that streets should be designed for all users, walkers, bikers, the young, the old, and the disabled, as well as drivers, is a really important public health concept. This will become even more important as the baby boomers age in this county um, and they'll be even more dependent on transit and safe places to walk. Nationally, walking has the highest fatality rate of any transportation mode, but federal funds for pedestrian safety, according to a study in 2004, so mid-decade, were less than 0.6% of the transportation budget. Another injury-related issue is violence. Um, violence and fear of violence affect health both directly through injury and death and indirectly by causing people to be less active and spend less time outdoors. The quotes on this slide are from community interviews conducted as part of the 2012 Santa Clara County uh, Latino Health Assessment. Uh, interviews were done in eight different counties, people talking about why they don't want to go outdoors, you know, just don't feel it's safe. 
According to this assessment, nearly one half of Latino adults report concerns about neighborhood safety compared to one third of whites and one quarter of Asian Pacific Islanders. More and more research is being done on the effect of community design on violence preventions and rates of crime. I'll just mention one interesting study that found that mixed use development in Los Angeles, um, in an area of Los Angeles, combining residential and commercial use was associated with less crime than blocks that were zoned commercially. And the conversation, of course, wouldn't be complete without talking about air quality. Um, <laughs> we've heard a lot about air pollution over the years, but this issue has not diminished in terms of importance. Air pollution is linked to cardiac and asthma symptoms and diminished lung capacity. And according to the California Air Resources Board, premature deaths linked to particulate matter, which is found in air pollution, are now at levels comparable to deaths from traffic accidents and secondhand smoke. And of course, climate change, which, uh, which Duane alluded to, um, which is affected by traffic emissions, poses another set of public health challenges, which I don't have time to go into today. That, that's a whole presentation in and of itself, but this is just a huge emerging uh, public health issue. And I just want to um, wrap up by mentioning a few of the ways that the public health department is working to support healthier environments. With the help from um, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, we've gotten grants that are funded from the Affordable Care Act or the Health Reform Law, um, which have helped us uh, provide technical assistance, training, and, and financial support for city and county strategies for active transportation, healthy food, and tobacco prevention. And we've been very pleased to be able to collaborate with the uh, Office of Planning of the county on uh, the first general plan health element um, and it, this is in the process of being created and we're hoping it will help to shape the other elements of the general plan and um, be a model for other cities in the county and other, and other counties. Uh, this existing conditions report is coming out very soon. I really encourage you to look for that because it's going to have a lot of great data. There'll be a lot on transportation and, um, and it, 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 hopefully it'll really move the conversation forward. Uh, the, we've also uh, worked with cities on a number of active transportation strategies. I've, I've listed, um, let me see, I may have gone back too far. There, sorry, I was on the wrong slide. Um, I also want to mention that uh, the general plan health element, you, you can go to healthysantaclaracounty.org and you can learn more about it there. And um, I've listed a number of the cities we've been supporting in, in various active transportation strategies. Um, I won't go through that list, but uh, I, I'll be happy to talk more about that if you're interested in that. And um, we've also been giving assistance to school districts that are interested in um, creating safe routes to school policies. And um, so far, uh, Gilroy, Sunnyvale, Santa Clara Unified, and Alum Rock have all um, passed a safe routes to school resolution and in the, are in the process of working on safe routes to school language for their wellness plans and their safety plans. And we hope to continue to work with more. And through the Traffic Safe Communities Network, which is staffed by the Public Health Department, we do a, a whole array of educational activities to reduce traffic inju injuries and fatalities. I work on bike and pedestrian safety, prevention of alcohol impaired driving, and through the VTA VERBS grant, which is vehicle emissions reductions based at schools, staff is working to promote walking and biking to school and are working with schools in Sunnyvale, Cupertino, Santa Clara, Los Gatos, and San Jose. And finally, through the, our new violence prevention initiative, we're going to be working to identify policy and environmental initiatives to prevent violence in priority areas of the county. And then finally, um, the, our epidemiology group has been doing a lot of great um, assessments, this new Latino health assessment. I encourage you to look at the Vietnamese health assessment, um, really looking at equity issues, impact on uh, particular neighborhoods and specific communities. Uh, and you can just go to our website, Santa Clara County Public Health Department, and click on the reports link to, to get to that data. So again, I just want to thank you um, for asking us to present today. and. Uh, as you can see, we have a lot of challenges and, and, a, um, and there are a tremendous number of public health issues that are impacted by um, transportation and land use. Thanks very much.
Good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be here, to, and especially because there's such an amazing turnout. I really want to uh, congratulate uh, Chris and Transform for uh, putting this together and clearly getting the word out, and for all of you for being here and caring enough about the future uh, of our valley and uh, our state. And you know, it's it's really great to follow uh, you know a representative from. Uh, the federal government and a county representative and, and me and with my city hat and other hats on but I, I think that what we're seeing here is something that's unique that we may not have seen certainly 10 or 20 years ago uh, but we're seeing this collaboration from the White House to literally the schoolhouse of how we start to think about planning the future of our communities and you know I, I just want to talk and I, I'm, I'm going to try to keep it relatively short so we have some time for a, a discussion but uh, just about the evolution of our community. And, and I think the evolution of our community starts with the evolution of ourselves as individuals. And, and for a moment, I want to talk about my own personal evolution growing up here in San Jose. Uh, I grew up in South San Jose. I still live in the same neighborhood I grew up in uh, since 1978, uh, over by the uh, Hayes Mansion. And you know, growing up here, uh, you know, in a average middle class family uh, with you know two cars, two kids, and uh, you know parents that were working, uh, the, there was a very little mentality in terms of using public transit, especially out in suburbia, so to speak. And you know, in many ways, a lot of what we're doing now is making up for, frankly, a lot of planning. Uh, errors in my belief, especially regarding transportation infrastructure uh, that were made many decades ago. And I think that over, thankfully, over the past uh, decade or more, we're seeing a, a change in the mentality amongst community members, amongst community leaders. Many of you are here uh, amongst elected leaders. We have, of course, former Mary Ron Gonzalez here, who uh, I, I was such a huge champion uh, before it was popular, uh, bringing BART to San Jose. And, and we've seen kind of the mentality of leadership from elected officials to uh, policymakers to community leaders change. And it wasn't like that, certainly, when I was growing up in San Jose. And, and when I used to go to school and, um, you know, I, I used to walk to my elementary school and then I used to uh, be driven to my middle school and dropped off there because the bus wouldn't pick up, wasn't picking us up from where we were. And then um, I used to either walk or be or, or driven uh, to my high school. And it was, you know, a, a, there, there was not a sense that, okay, well, I'm going to meet up with my friends, so how about I take this bus to the mall, you guys meet me there. It was always about how can we get a ride there. And in many ways, we're still trying to overcome that attitude, uh, and it's certainly a work in progress. You know, as I graduated high school, my first two years out of high school, I went to De Anza College, of course, in Cupertino. I lived in South San Jose. And for all, for many of you young people here, believe it or not, back then, 85 was not built yet. And so, <laughs> we, so we, and, and 101 280 was a mess. And so we used to find the most creative ways of driving to get there. It was three of us that used to drive um, from the neighborhood uh, in South San Jose to De Anza. And, I, and 85 got done right when I was finishing up at De Anza. But it, it shows like even then the, the idea of, of completing the, 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 uh, the, these transportation loops were still reliant heavily on the freeway system. And I went to Santa Barbara after that. And, and that was my first experience of, you know what, I don't need a car every day. And for those that have been to Santa Barbara, most people get around using their bike. And so it was great. You get a beach cruiser, you, you go to class, you go to work, pretty much everything on your bike. I, I had my car there just to come back and forth to San Jose. But while, while I was at school, I used my car maybe once or twice a week for a grocery run or something like that. But for the most part, you know, we were using our bicycles and that was part of the mentality. It was part of the culture that existed. I went on to law school in DC. I didn't have a car for three years and I didn't need one because of the metro system and, and it was just so easy to get around. And I mention all that because when I come back here, I, I, I'm thirsting <laughs> for that kind of lifestyle that I had over a period of years when I was living outside of the area. 
And when, as we think about, especially now in the role that I have now, I think about these experiences I've had and how I want to bring those experiences uh, to our community, but not just um, for the sake of change, but because I saw how effective it was in making sure that we can all move, we can uh, move uh, amongst our daily duties without uh, having to rely on a vehicle. And you know, I spent, I worked as a public defender for 11 years. And during my time in the public defender's office, I spent a lot of time visiting my clients in the neighborhoods they lived in, or visiting their families in the neighborhoods that they lived in. And we're talking about families that were low income, in, the mo in most cases, extremely low income, uh, below the poverty level families living in neighborhoods that had very poor infrastructure, transportation and otherwise. And I mention that because now I'm on the Caltrain board where the average ridership, uh, the average rider makes over $100,000 a year. Now, I'm absolutely supportive of and, and have been trying my best as well as the other board members and management in, in Caltrain to increase ridership. And we have the highest ridership we've ever seen. But I never forget about those families in those neighborhoods. When I think about, you know, uh, now on the BTA, when I think about the, what the primary function of our transit system is, and it's to make sure that everyone has access um, to public transit, that everyone has the ability uh, to move from point A to point B in an efficient manner, and especially those that don't even have cars. And I think that everyone, every one of us that does have a car, every opportunity we have where we can get out of that car uh, and move from point A to point B, uh, is, is we're that much closer to creating a community that I, I, that not only allows us to be prepared for the influx of people that are going to continue to come here and our pop, as our population grows um, organically as well, but I think we create a community that's much closer knit. Right now, where I live down in South San Jose, the, the old IBM is being built, it's the Hitachi site now, it's being built into uh, about 3,000 homes. Uh, there are two light rail stations and a Caltrain stop. There's uh, the bus line over on Monterey that's eventually going to be bus rapid transit. And so we're, we're thinking of our, our communities in a different manner. However, it doesn't come without growing pains. I mean, a lot of the people that live down there aren't accustomed to that type of development. And so there are a lot of concerns about increased traffic. Uh, there are a lot of concern about more people living in the neighborhood. We're not building these single family, large residential neighborhoods anymore, frankly, because we can't. Uh, unless we want to develop over places like Coyote Valley, which we don't. Uh, we want to make sure that we build in the, in the infrastructure, within the infrastructure that we have. And so it's, it's really interesting to see the mentality of the public start to shift and start to change. And I think a lot of it has to do with people that are in this room. You know, when I look around here, and I know many of you, many of you may or may not know each other. But you're from so many different parts of our community, um, so many different, uh, the, so many different walks of life. We have a lot of young people here, which is just great. Uh, but that's how we ultimately change the direction of our policies. It's not simply me uh, or, or or someone from HUD or someone from the county. It's all of us together. But we're informed by all of you. And the reality is, if any of one of us puts forward a policy, uh, that policy. You know, the, 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 the efforts or the uh, goals of that policy ring hollow if there's not a buy-in from the greater community. And so I do feel fortunate that we have an administration that is on board of what we're trying to do, certainly locally. We have, I think, one of the best county health departments you'll find anywhere in terms of being innovative and pushing the envelope. Uh, and I think that we have elected leaders that, that are, are willing to work in a new way. Uh, in terms of creating uh, the, the future cities uh, of the Bay Area. But it all comes down to the willingness of the people to be able to step up and say, this is what we want, this is what we need. And looking around this room, I see so many of you that have done that, many of you for many years. And I think your efforts are now, uh, are, are, are really shining through. And so uh, I'm so happy to have the opportunity to be here. Uh, to, to have transform bring us together and I have a, a very strong suspicion that although this is the first transportation summit it's not going to be the last one and I look forward to all of you being back again and, um, and frankly even bringing more people on board so that we can continue to build communities that we're proud of and most importantly bring, build the sustainable communities that, um, that allow us to grow closer together and allow us to move freely uh, in a way that we've never seen before. So thank you all.
We only have a, a few minutes, and, and I've got a couple questions here, and, and this is directed to, to each of you. How do residents who care about these issues but don't necessarily have a ton of time to commit to these kind of planning processes, some of which are very long-term, as you mentioned, how, you know, how can residents really be effectively engaged and bring about these kind of changes in their communities that ideally we, we would like sooner rather than later? It's true. These are multi-year planning processes often. I think you have to be engaged enough to not lose track of what's happening. You have to give yourself respite though as well. You can't burn yourself out in these processes. And so one thing I think you do is you involve friends and neighbors so that there are more of you working together to share the load of how you get involved in the process. The other thing I think about too is there are a lot of community organizations. Now Transform is a regional organization. They work in multiple communities. But often there are local neighborhood based or citywide um, organizations and you have to make them aware how important these issues are to you and get them involved as well so they can be representing your interests in, as paid professionals to keep the conversation moving but with the frame that you have in mind. I would just uh, second that in the sense that it's sometimes hard for individuals, not that individual leadership isn't important, but getting your organizations to, to buy on to, you know, put, putting these things in their principles and, and uh, we're trying to work a lot on policy changes with organizations and, um, and, and then cities of course are doing these enormous planning processes which um, they invite the public to, um, they always have visioning um, sessions for the public and I don't know that people know about know that that's happening uh, again and again all over the place with all these planning processes. Um, so, uh, and, and with the county uh, general plan health element there's still time for people to have input into that. Uh, I encourage you to go to the, the Santa Clara County or healthy Santa Clara County org and um, see how you can get involved with that process as well. Yeah, I, I think that they gave great suggestions. You know, as elected official, uh, we certainly uh, take seriously, you know, feedback we get from the community. I read all the emails that come in. And so even as an individual, you certainly can be heard that way, but I think the most effective way is to uh, find an organization um, that uh, is consistent with the values you have and, and work with them. And then it's not just you, you're working with other volunteers, you're working with other folks, or create a network. I mean, right here before me, I see so many neighborhood leaders, community leaders. This is an extraordinary network. And there's no doubt that uh, although an individual voice, an individual email or a phone call has a profound impact, the, it's amplified uh, in such an enormous way when you're connected with others and you can you, you have a common message to, to send to those of us that are policymakers. And so I think today this is a great start that even as busy as all of you are, you're here today taking the time out here today and, and making connections and building that network today as you go back to your busy life on, you know, on Monday, uh, that network will stay in place as long as you, you, know, you put in the time and effort to at least stay connected to the network, so it's not always you that has to do the heavy lifting, but that work. You know, you see, imagine if you have something heavy to li heavy to lift. Literally, you know, the more of you that are there, it makes it much easier, and then you can share your time, share your energy. Um, when we have folks that come talk to us at the council or, or at VTA and so on, uh, those that are organized, those that uh, have well thought out opinions as well as constructive uh, criticism or solutions uh, are the ones that I think that get the, the, the most positive response back um, from the governmental uh, agency. And so uh, this, again, this is a big part of it today. Right. Uh, so I have a question for, oh, did you want to add Just anything? during the commercial breaks of the Oscars tomorrow when you're having your Oscar parties, you know, you can just turn on the TV and say, what do you guys think about that new uh, Santa Clara comprehensive plan thing? <laughs> and they don't know what it is, then you can tell them and you got them hooked, so. Nice. <laughs> Great suggestion. So, Susan, can you talk a little bit, a little bit about the aging of the population in Santa Clara County mm -hmm. and how that relates to transportation and land use planning? Sure. Um, I don't have the stats w right at my fingertips, but I do know that um, that th as the baby boom ages, we're going to have this big group of people <laughs> getting older and um, are going, they're going to be, in, in the way housing is um, organized in this county, uh, um, the nature of the suburbs and everything, people are going to be, uh, they're not going to necessarily be on, you know, transit lines and they're going to be more dependent on 
being able to, uh, you know, needing to walk and, and to use transit um, as this big group of pe uh, people ages. And of course, the elderly are use health care more than um, somebody in their 20s. And so they have more um, health care visits. So they're also going to be needing, you know, access to clinics and other services. And um, so uh, there, there are a number of ways. And then also they're more vulnerable, uh, just like children, the elderly aren't moving as fast. Maybe there's arthritis, other issues, and uh, our, the way our streets are designed here, we have these, you know, we have these long blocks without crossings and, uh, and very wide streets. And so I, I take transit and I'm a pedestrian and I'm, um, I'm getting up there, but you know, I'm not to the point yet where I can't walk pretty quickly, but um, it's kind of scary sometimes, you know, to, to be able, getting across a, a busy intersection and, um, and sometimes you've probably heard some of the stories around the country. Uh, I, she wasn't an elderly woman, but a woman who, who tried to get across a, a boulevard somewhere in the southeast and, and her child was killed and she was actually prosecuted for that um, and she was just trying to get across the street in a place where there were lousy connections. So I think that this issue is going to become more and more important that we have safe crossings and um, um, good sidewalks. There are lots of times when sidewalks don't connect at all or neighborhoods, uh, you know, we really do have cities in this county that were built without sidewalks and that was sort of the rural bucolic notion of uh, that community and um, but that's a real problem for children trying to walk or the elderly or the disabled so great thanks so Duane uh, for a housing official you have a lot to say about transportation uh, can you say more about HUD and it's how it's interpreting its mission with re with regards to transportation sure so one of the reasons that that's the case is we've learned over the last decades that uh, how transportation is laid out and all the things we were talking about this morning have profound impacts for people's access to opportunity and so there's a rethinking going on at our agency around how we invest in um, subsidized housing how we do supportive housing making sure that people have access to transportation that they can get to jobs that they can actually get to the other essential services they need. And that's a, a sea change, really, for uh, us as an agency to figure out. The other thing that we figured out, and I mentioned the partnership we have with EPA and DOT, is that if we can coordinate our actions together as federal agencies, it makes the work of local communities that much easier to do. And so we've been now, since 2009, working very aggressively to figure out ways to make regulations talk to each other. And sometimes it's amazing how uh, planning efforts, I think we've counted 17 different federal requirements for planning for local communities to often to pursue in order to get the resources they need to move forward. So we're looking for ways to coordinate and cooperate and actually get more direct input from uh, local communities uh, as, we th move, as we move forward. Great. So we have just a couple more minutes. Does, does anybody want to add any final remarks um, before we head off to the next sessions? Oh, the only thing I'd say is uh, Look at your, uh, you know, your agenda. Find the issues that are really interested to you, and w if you don't see something that's interesting to you on the agenda, or there's a question you have that's not being answered, let the Transform staff know. That I, I know this organization from previous work; they're very responsive. This is a great opportunity to start to have the conversation in, in this part of the the uh, community really reflect your interest, and so they can be an ally in making that happen. Are there any questions? Well, no, we just we have like a couple minutes. So, if, if any of you have any final words? I, I, I just want to again thank all of you for being here, and uh, I'm. It's really exciting. I was telling um, someone earlier that I'm not much of a morning person, so I came in here trying to get my coffee, and I didn't need it when I walked in here. It was, I just felt instantly energized um, by the folks that are here, some of whom I know, and some new faces, a lot of the young people, and it's just. Uh, I, I think that we have something here that's really special, and, and I look forward to building on it. We did still get that coffee, though. <laughs> Great. So, so um, again, a round of applause for our plenary. Thank you again.